On this episode of Law Weekly, I speak with a senior advocate of Nigeria, Jin Chiazo Anishere, okay. about the Nigerian laws and how it affects women. We also talk constitutional amendments and much more. Also showing on this episode of the program highlights from the Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, Serap's launch of his report on the state of the civic space in Nigeria. Plus a recap of some of the top legal stories in the news. Hello and welcome to Law Weekly. I'm Shola Shoyeli. Issues of women and women's rights again take center stage as we count down to the celebration of women against the background of the International Women's Month. My guest is one of Nigeria's most prominent maritime lawyers, editor, author, and a senior advocate of Nigeria. Jean Chiazo Anishere studied law at the University of Ife, now Obafemi Awolo University, and was called to the bar in 1986. She would later go back to the University of Lagos for her master's in law, LLM, in 1990. And in 1996, she backed the Certificate of Merit in shipping from the Cambridge Academy of Transport, UK. In 1997, she was awarded the International Woman of the Year by the International Biographical Center of Cambridge in recognition of her services to the legal profession. And in 2005, she was named the International Professional of the Year for excellent practice in the field of law. She's won numerous awards, chaired several committees, and held several positions in the maritime sector, arbitration, and even internationally. In 2020, she was conferred with the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Now, against the background of the International Women's Month, I began our interview by asking her if there are still laws that discriminate against women in our statute books. Not that I know of. Um... Last year, there was this um, outburst, as it were, about women not give, being given the opportunity to give their husbands citizenship, you know, which men could. And I know that at the House the National Assembly, the issue came up seriously. Women took to the streets, and um, the matter has been brought before the uh, National Assembly, the House of Rep. It's gone up for second reading. So, since it's being tabled before the National Assembly, I'm sure they'll work on it. I'm sure it's going to be taken care of. So, so that shouldn't be an issue any longer. Um, again, it's the Matrimonial Causes Act. That used to be discriminatory of some sort, where, where the decree in ISI has become absolute. In Nigeria, we're not as fortunate as in, in Europe, where the lady takes the property of the man as long as the, she's got kids or she's lawfully married to the man you know so that is probably to keep the sanctity of marriage so here in Nigeria the same thing if the divorce is through the lady can still keep the house if she wishes to stay in that house notwithstanding that she hasn't got um, legal title as it were like seeable in her name she can still take a part of the house and live in it um, Laws on discrimination are being taken care of by uh, lawmakers. Women are becoming very aware of their rights and they're speaking out. So these, um, what do I call it now? Is it an acronym or this policy of Sarosuke as it were, is, is become a reality that is speaking out. Speak out has become a reality and women are becoming very much aware of the rights. The men are having to accommodate us. The laws are friendlier. Yes. The number of women in governance in Nigeria is also very few. Do you agree with those who say perhaps it's time to legislate for more women participation in governance? Yes, indeed. I agree that the legislation should be specific. Should say that we should have the female gender in this ratio, 40 to 60 percent, or even 50 50 percent of the women, as long as they're qualified. If it's specific, then the women will go for that. We will have something to work towards, we have something to look up to, we have something to claim. But being mute as it is now leaves it open for debate, for discuss, and allows the men to torpedo as it were, you know, and not give us that opportunity to fill in the gap of 50-50 or 40-60. So I, I totally am for the legislation being specific 
on the ratio of the women that would occupy or that should occupy government positions. There are a lot of women who are qualified you know, to occupy government positions. We don't need to look far. But I think it's basically that some women shy away from having to go into politics because of all the hula baloo that it takes and the fact that we're not encouraged by the legislation. There's nothing to say that it's 50-50 women, so just go for it. If you can bring up good manifesto, if you, if you can tell us the metal that you're made of and that you're qualified, knowing that the policy says 50% goes to women, we'll go for it. Are you aware if there's any, any such laws uh, globally in other, other jurisdictions? Rwanda is a good template to start with. You know, that's been the pride of Africa now. It used to be South Africa. But it's so ex exciting and encouraging to see a lot of women occupying positions in the government in Rwanda at par with, with the men. In the United States? Uh, yes, indeed. The sit with the, the, the presidency. Yes, indeed. And I think they said there's uh, maybe they're a wee bit um, outnumbered the men. But there are more women that I know. There are more women in Rwanda sitting in the positions of power, sitting, you know, with the presidency. I'm so excited about the review that is uh, ongoing. The constitution review. Yes, the constitution review. Uh, letters have been sent out to various NGOs, women NGOs, uh, to have a look at, make their contributions, send down, send in their own memoranda. That is very encouraging. That is good. So it's an opportunity for women to now bring their views to bear. Have a look at the constitution where provisions are plethora, where the provisions therein stating that women cannot occupy these seats or where women are being, um, uh, how, do, how do I put it, uh, prejudiced against um, the, the men. So this window is what we women should ensure that we take advantage of. Really sit down, study our constitution, make our views by way of memoranda, submit to the National Assembly and ensure that when it is time for public hearing that we do sit with them so we can also air our views and be able to defend our memoranda. Let's talk about your journey into the inner bar. Would you say that you faced any discrimination uh, on the basis of gender? Because we still have very few female SANs compared to the men. There are very few indeed. We're actually 30, uh, less than 40 female senior advocates of Nigeria as opposed to well over uh, a thousand men, uh, male senior advocates of Nigeria. Discrimination? Well, I wouldn't say there is any legislation that discriminates. I mean, we are all gentlemen of the bar. No, I'm not even talking about this, um, legislation, but I'm talking about in practice. In practice. Yes. Oh, well, at the inner bar. No. That, 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 that kind of limits um, women climbing. I mean, what's, what's, what's responsible for such few numbers of women at the inner bar? I think it's because of the other positions that we occupy at home. <laughs> because it's the same requirement that we all have to satisfy to be able to attain the silk. It's very tough, it's onerous, and um, it's tougher for women because of our position as mothers, as wives, having to leave our homes as early as six to catch a first flight, probably to be able to get to the uh, another jurisdiction because you have a matter in the appellate court in, in trying to meet your requirements of the number of judgments that you should have uh, at the appellate courts. You know, you have to perform your wifely duties, you have to perform your motherly duties. Surely you don't want to leave all this to the housekeeper. Um, particularly if you don't have a hobby that is quite understanding and is accommodating, that could be a Herculean task. Would you say that this is what is also responsible for the low number of um, women in leadership positions in the bar? Because since then, Priscilla Kuye became president of the NBA, we've not had anyone you know, reach that height. Well, the 
taking the helm of affairs of the Nigerian Bar as the president of the Nigerian Bar Association is not is not as onerous as taking silk. I mean, you don't need to uh, make certain requirements of uh, appellate judgments and, and what have you. You just have to show leadership skills, leadership qualities, and, and um, you, you have to show prove that you're a good team player. So I wouldn't say that our domestic chores at home would limit us showing interest in showing the man that we can also lead, if not better, as president of the Nigerian Bar Association. So why are we not having women come out to do this? What do you think is responsible? I, I think it's motivation. Women must learn to support one another. We must learn to encourage one another. I guess that's why I'm so excited about this year's theme for IWD, um, Inspire Inclusion. It's, it's not only inspiring inclusion, it's increasing women for economic progress, which is another of the theme from um, IMO. Did you always want to be a lawyer? That's a story. You, you'll be surprised that my jam never read law. Wow. <laughs> my jam result never read what law. Did, what was your first choice? Medicine. Okay. You know, although I did, I uh, had a stint of optometry, I was in the science field at the University of Benin. But the beautiful thing for my dad, who actually changed my course from medicine to law, was that I had 10 subjects. I sat 10 subjects for WIAC. So I had a combo of arts and science, you know, for years for was my WIAC. Was he a lawyer? No, his, his parents couldn't <laughs> afford to send him to the uni to study law that he wanted so much to do. And my dad saw in me the lawyer that he couldn't become and turned my, <laughs> my soul, as we say in the maritime law. And um, in those days, we listened to our parents. There was nothing like, dad, let me do what I feel like doing. Like kids nowadays have, a, have their own you know, ways. No, you, you, your dad says he wants you to do this. He says, yes, daddy, I have no regrets. And hence I named my chambers after him in his lifetime. Funny, I, I don't even like the sight of blood. <laughs> I, would have, I would have made a terrible medical practitioner. <laughs> Let's talk about a constitutional amendment. There's talk of another amendment exercise in this present 10th National Assembly. I know there's been talk about um, restructuring to reflect true federalism. There's also been that debate about um, dumping the presidential system of governance for the parliamentary system of government. But what areas do you think should be addressed and what, what kind of reforms would you like to see in our constitutional amendment process? First is that provision for equal rights for women, which is, which has been identified, thank goodness, and you know they're asking women to now bring their positions to bear. That's very important. Equal rights for women, 50-50 or 40-60 for women to participate and sit in the governance, even at the presidency. That's good. That's key. Uh, parliamentary system. I don't know. We, we haven't even been able to get it right with the democratic system that we find ourselves in. And then we want to dump it and jump to another one. I, I, I think that's not the solution. The parliamentary system is the United States, isn't it? It's, it's just not it. It's us getting the provisions of the constitution right. It's us you know, contributing to its making. I, I appreciate the fact that the first constitution did not have majority of Nigerians, you know, to participate in it. So it's like, it's just being foisted on us. So I can understand uh, the problem we're having with that constitution. But now we're going to have a town hall, as it were. Everyone who is a Nigerian who is able to understand writings can come and say it, how you want your constitution, what actually guides your, 
your life, your governance, you know, to come make a position, make make your own contribution to it. That's beautiful. Democracy is good if we practice it well. I don't think we should. We're just going to be like forum shopping. It's like playing the, the game of ping pong. That's table tennis. So what happens if we dump democracy and we take parliamentary and we don't get it right with parliamentary? What's going to happen? We dump parliamentary and probably look for something, federalism, like you got. And what happens if we don't get it right? We look for another form of government. We are just playing the ping pong. Let's get it right this time. We're working towards it. Everyone, bring in your memoranda. Go read your constitution. Tell us areas in the current con present constitution where you feel that we need to amend to suit your gender or to make life easy for the lowly, the children, children rights, very important because the children cannot speak for themselves right now. So we have to protect their, their interests. So that's also very important and many more. So if we can get the constitution right and practice it, I think we're good to go. We'll be the envy of Africa and maybe the world. Thanks for staying tuned. Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project Serap has launched his report titled Crackdown on Media Freedom and Civic Space in Nigeria. The initiative is part of Serap's work to promote respect for media freedom and the right to freedom of expression in Nigeria. We have this report up next. As a rock dealer, I've never been privileged to be in it, but that perhaps underscores the nature of access to information in Nigeria. I do know that group tours are organized to the White House. I have never had the privilege of seeing or hearing a group tour of the presidential dealer. I know if something as simple as that is not available and accessible by the public, how do you think the nature of budgetary allocations and the expenditure would be available? But that is beside the point. At Serap, for instance, we've sent a, we sent a lot of correspondence to that particular building, Asurok, as part of our various advocacy initiatives. And we always get it um, acknowledged by just a simple name, just the first name of a person. You see that title or blessing, nothing more. And we're told several times that that is all and that there is no official acknowledgement of any sort, which is always an issue in court for the judges who ask us, how are we sure that this letter was delivered to the internet that they see, that he is the president? And that has happened for more than 12 years. These, sadly, are the realities of our democracy. With these words, the Deputy Director Serap Kola Wale Oluwadari set the tone for an interesting conversation on the civic space in Nigeria and how it is shrinking. Participants here include invited members of the House of Representatives, representatives of the executive, judiciary, lawyers, police, civil society, journalists, bloggers, students, and many others. Citing sections 22, 39, and 40, which guarantee media freedom and freedom of expression, some of the speakers here noted that government has adopted anti-democratic measures to constrict the civic space. Restrictive measures and legislation, such as the recent reintroduction of the social media bill, show the growing evidence that civic space in Nigeria is shrinking and is under threat. So also is the harassment, intimidation, and violence against journalists, bloggers, and human rights defenders. There are good laws. When good laws find their way into the hand of bad executive, they become bad laws. And that is what we have in Nigeria today. We have the cyber crime of 2015. We have the Company and Allied Act, we call it Kama, Company and Allied Matters Act 2020. There are some provisions there that are patently against the rights of people to freedom of expression, the rights of people to have access to information. And even when we go under the Freedom of uh, uh, Information Act, they dodge it. We write to them, they will refuse to produce. We get judgment in the court, they refuse to obey. For the lawmakers, beyond complaining, it's time for more people to get involved and build allies to ensure collaboration that will see things improve. 
First, civil society needs to address issues of inclusivity and diversity within its own ranks of leadership. I think civil society needs to sit down. There are 360 members in the House of Reps. There are 109 uh, in the Senate. Uh, out of that, when you come with your one-size-fits-all idea of all public servants, uh, you fail to realize that about 75% of us are new members, 75% in the 10th Assembly that have never been in Parliament before. So you're losing a great opportunity of cultivating a new breed. In the launch of its report on the civic space, SARAP has urged the government to push for the immediate amendment of the Cybercrime Act, the Official Secrets Act, and other repressive legislations to bring them in tandem with international human rights standards and agreements. <laughs>
Gambari and equally sought an order of perpetual injunction restraining the respondents and agents from further detaining him in relation to any investigation into or demands from Binance. He urged the court to order for the respondents to issue a public apology to him. Gambarian, who said that he was in Nigeria alongside Flynn, Nadim and Jarwala to honor the invitation of the NSA and EFCC to discuss issues relating to Binance, also argued that he did not commit any offense during the meeting and neither was he informed in writing of any offense he personally committed in Nigeria or at any other time. The trial judge, Justice Ian Ekwa, adjourned the matter till April the 8th. Meanwhile, the federal government has fixed April the 4th for the arraignment of Binance Holding Limited, Tigran Gambarian, and Flynn and Jawala on allegations bordering on tax evasion. And we round off with the report that the Kano High Court has handed down a death sentence by hanging to a 47-year-old Chinese national, Frank Geng Guangrong, for the murder of his Nigerian girlfriend, Umukulsum Sani, age 22. The tragic incident occurred on September the 16th, 2022, at Jambulo quarters in Kano. Justice Sanusi Adomaji, who presided over the case, further recommended mercy on behalf of the convict to be considered by the Kano state governor. The court held that the prosecution, led by the Attorney General of Kano State, Haruno Dederi, successfully proved its case beyond reasonable doubt. Dederi recounted the events leading to the fatal stabbing, emphasizing the defendant's culpability. Despite Frank's plea of not guilty, the court heard from six witnesses and examined four exhibits, all reinforcing the prosecution's case. The defense counsel, Mohammed Dang Azumi, presented Frank's testimony, where he claimed self-defense, alleging that the victim had attacked him first. And this is where we are joined proceedings for today. Do remember to check out the Channels TV website for a replay of this episode of the program, as well as past episodes. Please also send in any feedback via our social media handle. I am Shola Shiele. Thank you for watching and see you next week.